Good evening, Lake Orion. Welcome to History Now here on ON TV. I'm your host, Anthony Termina. It's been a while, so welcome back. And, um, you know, so we'll go from there. Um, I want to talk to you guys today about something that's very, very important in the important to my heart and very important to a lot of um, to a lot of you guys as well is um, the history of American football basically gridiron football er. basically the a lot of people wonder about what is the history of American football it's one of the most popular sports maybe the popular sport in the United States it is one of the pop, most popular sports in the world um, We've seen it played in the youth levels, the high school levels, middle school levels, college levels, and in the pros as well. Um, before we start going over the history, I wanted to introduce what is football. Um, basically, it's 11 players on offense and defense, played on a rectangle, rectangular field with goal posts. Um, you have four attempts to get 10 yards. You go 10 yards, you get another four attempts to continue the drive. The goal is to score at the opposing team's end zone, which is basically a, if you score, it's a touchdown. You can also get field goals if you can't score into the end zone and, and you're close enough. You kick football into the goal post, which is basically a field goal. The offense's goal is to advance and drive the football, whether it's by running, throwing, or if you're close enough on a fourth down, um, kicking it into the goal posts, which would be a field goal. The defense's goal is to stop the offense and to cause turnovers, cause havoc, get the football for themselves and for their team. The most points wins the game. Now, definite, now it's, pretty, it's pretty straightforward, but um, it can be a little more... Um, but it... You went over several rule changes over the years. We're going to go over that in a few minutes. Um, but I want to talk about the, um, the positions in football first before we go over the, the history of it. So the primary positions on offense are is obviously you start with the quarterback. He's the leader of, he's the, leader of the offense. He's, he, he is either the play caller or the coach will be calling the plays. Um, often lines up behind the center is basically executing the play, running the play. Um, the quarterback is seen as the leader of the offense, making sure everybody is is in position to where they to when the play begins. You have the halfback, the running back, or the tailback. You're basically running in the play. Um, you have basically finding the holes, finding the gaps. Um, taking advantage of the running in, of the gaps. And um, also you have the fullback, which is a larger running back, but it also can be seen as the blocker. So you've got the running back, the tailback, or the fullback. And the, they are behind the, behind, the, behind the line. The offensive line is probably the most important job in football. You have to protect the quarterback and running back at all costs. The center is often seen as the leader of the line. You've also got the guards and the tackles, which are by the sides. Um, basically, the goal of the offensive line is to protect the quarterback, make sure the defense doesn't get to the quarterback, because if they do get to the quarterback, that's not a good thing for, for, the, off for the offense. So wide receivers, the goal is to catch the passes from the quarterback but also could be seen as decoys and blockers. Same goes for tight ends. Usually they get the short passes, often perceived as the more physical, the bigger body type of, type, type of um, tight, tight, in the tight end position. Um, sometimes you get those tight end positions, sometimes you do not. Um, but for it to work, that's pretty much your whole offense. For, um, and then you have your defense. The def you have the defensive line. It starts with the defensive line. The goal is to hit the quarterback and the running back, to create havoc, to cause turnovers, also known as picks or interceptions, fumbles. You want to get the you want to get fumbles if you're the defense, because uh, if you get fumbles and you get the ball, then your offense gets to come on the field and takes over possession, and the defense has done its job. The defensive line, obviously the 
basically it starts with defensive line, then you have the defensive ends and the defensive tacklers. And the goal for the them is to stop inside and stop outside plays. Basically, you're keeping an eye on the ball. You're not keeping, you know, you're trying to keep an eye on the ball and where the ball goes. That's why you hear in football games, you know, watch the ball, watch the ball. Um, it, and, I mean, because that, because where the ball is going, that's what you want to get. You want to get the ball. So, but that's the goal of the, the defensive line. The linebackers, usually behind the line, serve as the defensive leaders, and they are the ones that. A lot of times, you see the you can see the defensive line make plays, big plays. Linebackers also make big plays. They're kind of looking at. You know, they're kind of communicating with the defensive line. They're, they're kind of communicating. They're basically the, quote, leaders of the defense. So, I mean, they're basically often seen as the second line of defense, defending the run, stopping the quarterback and running back, containing and containing tight ends. So, a lot of times when tight ends get the ball, they're usually tackled by the linebacker. Then you have the defensive backfield. It's corners. You line up outside the formation. Usually, you're, usually the corners are the opposite spot of the wide receiver. The corner's job is to stop the wide receiver and to obviously cause havoc, get turnovers, mostly picks. Um, and then the safeties are often seen as the last line of defense. You've got the strong safety, you've got the weak safety. You line up with the corners, but you're also they're also responsible for stopping the big play. You also got special teams which special teams is you want to execute field, goal, field goals, punts, extra points, um, punt returners, the big play, taking the, running the ball, like say for example, you're running the football on the, um, your 20 yard line, but then getting as much yards to put your offense in a better position to where they can potentially get touchdowns or make big plays. Um, you've got the kicker, you got the holder, and you got the long snapper, okay? The kicker, the kicker will obviously the goal is to kick the either the extra point or field goals or just to punt it. You've got a holder and then you got a long snapper. A lot of times you don't. A lot of times the, a lot of times you won't need a long snapper as much as a kicker and a holder. The holder is usually there if you're making a, a field goal. They often have tees. But sometimes, if like if it's windy or something like that, they'll have a holder to to hold the ball so the kicker can kick the ball. Then you obviously made mention with the punt returner. You run the you run the ball after a punt. Um, the goal is to help the offense. You've got and um, so basically those are your primary positions in football. Now, I want to talk about also. Let's talk about the officials, the officiating crew. Usually there's seven officials in football. There's the referee, which is the head man in charge. <laughs> you have an umpire, a back judge, a down judge, who's basically seen as the head linesman, the side judge, the line judge, and a field judge. Each of the officials will carry a yellow flag. Okay, A yellow flag usually means a penalty is going to be called on that play. Okay. It can be, and they'll have play calls determining what the penalty was. It could be a personal foul. It could be a line encroachment. It could be a, um, you know, it could be roughing the passer. It could be all of those things. And there's certain and there's certain penalties for that as well. Like you can go negative 15 yards, negative 10 yards. Um, personal foul is usually 15 yards. Um, Five yards is usually typically for a line encroachment. Um, you don't want to see the yellow flag. Um, you don't want to see the yellow flag, or as they call it, yellow yellow laundry. Now sometimes the flags will be for can be pink or other colors, like for major, like for example, breast cancer awareness. You could see referees have um, pink whistles or pink flags, um, which I think is very very cool. You also have a chain crew, which is typically three guys. Um, moving the chains, usually two big 10-yard sticks. Um, it further helps the officials in terms of like um, determining whether where, it's, where the play ended or 
what down it is. Um, and if they get to the first down, then they move the chains to where to where the whether they move the chains to where whether you get another chance to get a first down or another chance to um, or turnover on downs and the other team gets to go the other way with the chains. Um, football is seen as a contact sport. Safety has been a very top priority, especially over the years. You've um, Players are wearing helmets and shoulder pads. You have other pads as well. You got thigh pads, knee pads, guards, cleats, chest protectors, mouth guards, etc. Most injuries occur in the lower extremities, lower areas, which is like the waist on down. But you also got concussions. Concussions have been a big concern in football, especially dealing with brain injuries, um, head to head injuries. Uh, you know, especially when you get older, you deal with dementia, Parkinson's, uh, CTE, chronic traumatic epilepsy, which is also known as CTE. Yeah, you've been hearing a lot about CTE in the news in terms of like um, how it impacts players. Um, Aaron Hernandez comes to light when you're thinking, when you're thinking about CTE. Also depression. Um, there have been moves to... Um, you know, to make the game safer. Um, a lot more teaching about tackling. Um, also make mention how football has been played starting from the youth leagues, then it goes up the chain from middle school to high school to college and then to professional, if you get lucky enough, whether you're playing in Europe or whether you're playing in um, the NFL. Um, it's definitely, there's definitely a bigger like, you know, bigger level so like you think of youth league on the bottom then you go to the middle schools you, it's like a step higher high school is a step higher college and then um professional um like in the youth leagues you often got um you've got two 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 like levels so you've got like maybe like a you have two levels in the youth leagues some will have three some will have one team two teams Middle school, it's typically you've got a seventh grade team and an eighth grade team. In high school, you've got typically a freshman team, a junior varsity team, and a varsity team. College, you've got the one team, and then professionally, you've got the one team. It's very popular in the United States, in Canada, Japan, Europe, Brazil, um, and football will continue to grow. Um, it's definitely, when we come back, we're going to talk about the history of American football here on History Now, here on ONTV. Orion Neighborhood Television is your community media outlet. Our mission is to empower community members and groups to create, communicate, and connect through television and video production. For more than 35 years, ONTV has offered video production classes to residents of all ages and provides them with the equipment and facilities to produce their own programs. Not only are residents encouraged to produce programs, but ONTV staff produces programs that promote local nonprofits and community groups like the Chamber of Commerce, the Orion Township Public Library, the Lake Orion Lions Club, and the Orion Arts Center, to name a few. ONE TV has been um, very important for all our events. We have our community Dragon on the Lake and Art and Flower Fair. We also have our holiday market and um, they're always out there promoting us and um, covering our events but also promoting through um, on-site interviews at the studio which are very helpful and to have the footage after for us to be able to use in our marketing materials and to put on our Facebook, it's been really beneficial for us. Yes, ONTV has just been a great partner. Um, we're so thankful for them. And what they do is they really come to all of our events, especially our ribbon cuttings, having their ribbon cuttings documented so that they can archive it, put it in their business history, post it on social media, means so much to our small business owners. They've really never seen anything like that before, and that's what's so unique about the Orion community and ONTV, is that they're always there for us. Last year, they did 18 ribbon cuttings. They stay from the start to the finish. They interview the small business owners, and we all just couldn't be more grateful. The staff ventures out into the community to cover events like parades, festivals, concerts, and high school sports, 
And for more than 30 years, Owen TV has provided the equipment and staffing needed to televise township and village meetings live to Lake Orion residents. In Michigan, it's a unique model, and I don't know how it works in other states, but in Michigan specifically, we don't have to pay to put the equipment in our, our facilities that, so we can broadcast these meetings. And government transparency, it's not just a buzzword, it's, it's required uh, in today's day and age. Um, but the fact that our residents aren't paying for that through their property taxes is, is, is invaluable in my opinion. The fact that it's funded through these franchise fees that the cable companies have paid forever, um, a few pennies literally on, on cable bills helps fund uh, this really important um, you know, government isn't trusted anymore. This is one way um, people trust us because we're closer to them, but everything we do is in the light of day. And it's thanks to this funding that exists, a uh, really unique mechanism that allows us to continue to, to give that to our residents. I think it's mission critical for clarity, honesty, and uh, uh, just getting the message of local government out to its residents. I mean, Social media has become a way to do that, but on TV is on social media. So uh, I, I don't think that we can broadcast meetings in any other way or better uh, at a better rate or a better price than what ONTV provides. ONTV also provides the video equipment that Lake Orion High School students use as they prepare for a career in broadcasting. The franchise fees, the PEG fees uh, that fund ONTV and the Cable Commission actually benefit and fund our program as well. Uh, we're able to ask for grants from that organization, from ONTV, from the Cable Commission to help us. Uh, we're very fortunate to have one of the best broadcast programs in the state, if not the country, um, and they're a huge funding revenue source for us uh, to be able to provide our students past and present with amazing technology that's very comparable to what the, the, the professionals use in the industry. ONTV's podcast studio and training give producers an opportunity to educate and entertain listeners. To sign up for classes or for more information, call 248-393-1060 or visit orionontv.org. Welcome back to History Now here on ONTV. I'm your host, Anthony Terramina also co-host of Between Terminas, which is um, hoping to have the show come back soon. Um, obviously, History Now is the origin of Between Terminas, so I have to give Between Terminas a shout out. And uh, Sam and Ian, love you guys. All right, so let's talk, about the, let's talk about the history of American football. Um, we kind of went over football, what it is. Um, so we're going to talk about the history of it. So gridiron football originated from both rugby and soccer. Rugby is rugby's often seen as a game where it's like, you know, you're trying to get a brown ball into the into the end zone. It's pretty similar to modern day football. And then soccer is in soccer you've also got a um, and then also so at soccer also with the big field and then you've you know you're running with it, kicking um, the first ever football game was played on November 6, 1869, in a game between Rutgers and Princeton. It was based off of soccer rules at the time. Rutgers won that game 6-4, to four, but at the time, you had 25 players played, played with a round ball. You had 25 players out on the field. It could not be picked up or carried. It could be kicked or batted with feet, hands, head, or sides. The goal was to advance it to the opposing goal. Now, it's interesting, 25 players could be seen as very, very dangerous. And a lot of people saw it as very dangerous, but a lot of people also loved it and they saw it as very, very fun. Um, you had the origins of both rugby and soccer both originating from, right, and it was the first ever gridiron football game between two teams. Now, the collegiate play, this play, continued for several years, and there had to be some rules in terms of making sure, because more teams were getting interested in wanting to play gridiron football, what it was. So, representatives of Yale, Columbia, Princeton, and Rutgers at that time, the Ivy League met 
1873 to introduce rules in which fields were uh, 400 by 250 feet, which was 122 meters by 76 meters. Teams were set at 20 players each. So t instead of 25 players could play, now you had 20 players that could play. Okay. Now, so this had a little bit of opposition too, especially from Harvard. Harvard preferred the, quote, Boston style, which was 11 players on the field, um, running, running, with, running the ball, basically rugby style game, which without having an opponent having to chase them, the, they also introduced the pigskin football, which I'm wearing on my shirt. This is the pigskin football, also known as the oblong, rather than the round ball. You could do tackling, and then they also liked the forward pass. Now we're going to talk about the forward pass in a few minutes because the forward pass would become very, very important. So Harvard, what Harvard wanted to do was they liked playing with the Boston style. And a lot of times, a lot of times when schools played each other, they liked to have their own set of rules, which was rather it was like the the 20 players each, or the field, like the, the 20 players, or the or in Harvard's case, the Boston style rules were 11 players around the field. So there was no clear set rules, but there was, but you had an idea. So now in 1875, Yale, Columbia, Princeton, and Rutgers all met again, which they would agree on a rugby rules with a modified scoring system. So they also formed the Intercollegiate Football Association which is the earliest we know as today's college football. Okay? Yale would not join this until 1879, but they were very much involved in the, in the rules process. So basically it's, it's very similar to, like it was pretty much like the Boston style, uh, the rugby rules, but with a modified scoring system. So rules were again changed in 1880, Walter Camp, who's often seen as the father of American football, came up with the concepts like the snap, line of scrimmage, the concept of downs. And prior to 11 players, there was like a, a, get, or like a compromise where it was at 15 players. 15 players were allowed to play on the field during a possession or a snap. So there was the, it was reduced from 15 to 11. Now, there was problems with the snap, okay? There was, if event of a scrum, which scrums, if you, whether you play rugby or if you play, um, it's a scrum is basically players packing close together. Today in um, the world of COVID, you had, if, if, if you saw a scrum, like, ah, oh no, you know, but scrums are when players pack closely together it's like tackling and those types of things you know you have that big group of you know of players like the offense and defensive line all going at each other in such close proximity um, oftentimes teams would punt in a scrum and usually if a team was in a bad situation uh, some teams were holding the ball gaining no ground, there would be like pauses, it was like, what's the point of, you know, scrumming if you're going to, you know, so I mean, something had to be done, okay? Something had to change with what the rules were. So it came to 1882, Walter Camp, again, the father of American football, came up with the concept of three downs, okay? So you had three opportunities, and if you couldn't get it in the third down, you had to either punt the ball or turn the ball over on downs. Okay? You advance the ball by five yards for another set of downs. Okay? So, like, for example, you get five yards, first down. You get another set of downs. You, they allow the scrum to return, obviously, in terms of, like, because um, the point of the, there was no point to scrum if players, if teams were holding the ball. So you had third, three opportunities to get a down. The scrum was returned. Failure to advance the ball five yards meant the opposing team would get the ball. And this separated football from rugby 
in terms of like, because if you didn't move the ball five yards or, you know, then the opposing team gets the ball. Reduce the football field sizes from, from or to 110 feet to 53 and a third feet. Basically 100.6 meters to 48.8 meters. There was an adoption of this, there was a scoring system. Four points for a touchdown, two points for a safety, and the extra point kick was also two points. The line of scrimmage was also introduced. Also, tackling below the waist was allowed. Later rule changes created the neutral zone, which is like the 50-yard line, the size and the shape of the football, which was the ob oblong, and it also legalized the forward pass. So quarterbacks could pass the ball and, and I could do a forward pass and um, you know, introduce the concept of, of passing. You still had tackling, um, and it's, but it still was a violent sport, okay? There was mass formations, so like military formations, those types of formations. It caused multiple injuries and even death. In 1905, we had 19 deaths, all caused by the massive hitting, injuries, um, whether it be concussions, tackling, um, waist injuries. I got to the point where President Theodore Roosevelt demanded change, changes to the rules or abolish the game altogether. Now football was very popular with college students, okay? So there was no, and um, did not want to see the abolishment of the game, but Teddy Roosevelt was clear. He demanded changes to make the game safer, or abolish the game altogether. So in 1906, 62 college schools met. It was the introduction of the Intercollegiate Athletic Association. And it, the, it was also would later be known as the NCAA, okay? It for, further enhanced the forward pass. The fields were wider by 40 yards the neutral zone, the neutral zone at the 50 yard line was also under. First down was, were changed from five yards to 10 yards. And then time, the time for the games reduced from 70 minutes to 60 minutes. So instead of like 35 minutes during, instead of 35 minutes, which typically you tend to see from soccer, today they're now 80 minutes, so it's like two 40 minute have their JV games are 35 minutes. But at the time you had two halves for 35 minutes. So now the time was reduced from 70 minutes to 60 minutes, which was, you know, in 60 minutes, which in four quarters, which for basically for four quarters, like basically 12 minutes. Um, roughing the, in 1912, the scoring would be adjusted. Okay, so field goal, so touchdowns were now, it went from up from four points to six points. You wanted a reward for running the ball or passing the ball for touchdowns. So touchdowns were six points. The extra point was one point. Uh, field goals were three points to value the kicking game. Um, four downs rather than three. So instead of going three downs, you went four downs. So you had first down, you had second down, you had third down. Fourth down, you had the option of either going for it, going to get the first down, or punting the ball away, especially if you were in a bad spot, then you could punt the ball away to the opposing team. And um, so then you had, so then the field was reduced to 100 yards, two 10-yard end zones, and also the concept of roughing the passer was introduced in 1914. Basically, you couldn't rough up the quarterback or else um, you couldn't rough up or you get a penalty for roughing the passer. College bowl games you had, so a lot, so the reward for college football teams was to go to college bowl games. But there was also a lack of a real national championship until 1997 when the, the BCS, the bowl championship series was introduced. But again, that was also controversial. So it was replaced in 2014 by the present college national or the college football playoff, which 
still is in existence for this day. Um, football also go professional. You had opportunities to make money. Um, November 12th, 1892, Pudge Helfinger, sorry if I got the name pronounced right or wrong, uh, was the first ever professional football player. You had players getting paid to play. It also caused issues because you had rising salaries. Players were going to different teams. Also, they were using college players, which at the time was illegal. You couldn't use, you know, they were still in school. They were still, you know, they, they were, they valued their academics. Uh, you couldn't pay, you couldn't pay college players either at the time. Um, so you had the introduction of, in 1920, the National Football League was born, the NFL was formed in 1920. It was the premier league in it was like the main league in 1922. In 1925 there was a big focus on the passing game and it got it further enhanced football because it wasn't just running the ball and grinding and playing tough football. It was, you could also pass the ball to wide receivers and they could get touchdowns like that as well. The Colts Giants game is often seen as the greatest game that's ever been played because the focal point on the passing, uh, you had that nice balance of running the ball, passing the ball, defense. Um, though it's often seen as the greatest game ever played. It's often mostly seen as a men's sport, but women can also play. No woman has played professional football as of yet. Things will change. I feel very confident in the next, in the next several years Eventually, it's going to happen, but uh, you will eventually see a woman play c professional football. But women have played in high school and in college football, particularly whether it be kicking or on the line or, you know, and it's, it's cool to see. 11% of the 5.5 million Americans who have played tackle football are women, so it's very, very cool to see. In 1960, the American Football League was formed. So, in... By the mid-1960s, football was the most popular U.S. sport. Now, it also introduced some changes, too. The importance of having a scorekeeper at games. Official time was kept on a clock rather than having an official watch. The officials watch pockets. So basically, so then you had the introduction of the option two-point conversion rather than extra points. Now, what the NFL was doing was the NFL was Fourth down, you didn't get it, you had to punt the ball away. This gave the option of two-point conversions rather than have an extra point. You had names on players' jerseys. Minorities, particularly African Americans, were starting to play in the in football. You had a lot of um, a lot of times you a lot of times it was often seen as a a quote white man sport, but you had minorities, particularly African Americans, were into were introduced and were playing in the AFL. They weren't playing in the NFL yet, but they were playing in the AFL. And, um, and eventually, you see more African Americans playing football today than you ever had back in the 60s. Um, there was also competition between the NFL and the AFL for both players and TV deals. That was that was big because TV was getting going. You had the, you and so there was often competition for TV deals. But this all ended in 1966 when it merged into one big conglomerate, one big NFL. So it became the National Football League, and you had the introduction of the Super Bowl, which is, which is the which is probably the the most it's the most highly rated, most um. Not just in TV, but I mean, it, it's truly, truly, truly a spectacle where the a, the NFC's best team, the AFC's best team, are playing each other for the Nash for the national championship in football, and um, it's just an amazing scene. And we still have that today, where the where the NFC and the AFC have playoffs, and then you go and then. The two best teams are playing each other in the Super Bowl, and only one team can come out the winner. So, I made mention. I made mention that. Um, I made mention that 
I mean, mention that basically there's been a focal point on safety. Um, obviously, it's important to teach about tackling. It's important to teach about the game. Um, they do a pretty good job in the youth levels. Um, and you see it grow in the middle schools, in the high schools, and then at college and professional. Now, the future of football will continue to grow. It remains one of the most popular sports to this day. It's very popular in communities. When I look at, you know, because obviously I'm involved in the high school ranks for football, I see it, you know, whether it be Lake Orion or Oxford or Clarkson or West Bloomfield, Romeo, um, anywhere, anywhere, you, anywhere you go, football is probably one of the most popular sports to say. I mean, when you go and you see like Oklahoma and Texas, you, you have these beautiful football fields where it's like, you know, it's, it's the big thing. It's like these college stadiums for high school games. That's the feeling that you get. That tells you how popular football is. Obviously, Friday night lights. Um, a lot of times with professional football, they'll play on Sundays. You still have the Monday night. Sometimes they'll play Saturday. Colleges often are mostly played on Saturdays. Youth games are pretty much are played mostly on Saturdays. High schools, mostly you think of Friday night lights. Some games are played on Saturday afternoons. Um, middle schools mostly are played like Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, like in the middle of the week. Um, it's just truly a special, it's truly special football and it brings communities together. Um, it's truly, it's very popular in communities and it, the future of football continues to be very bright and it will be. It's the, it's probably, it's pro it's the most popular United States sport. Um, I look forward to see what the future of football holds. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, all right, that'll do it for this episode of History Now. You guys take care, have a great night, and see you soon.